and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Biohazard Games, previously known as the de as the developer of of Blue Planet, along with Mi along with Midnight, and a whole host of other projects. This is not, but this is not one of those. This is not a project that is going downwind. This is a project better known as going upwind. <laughs> and nice. I, I see what you did there. That is the closest thing you will ever hear to me making a fart joke. <laughs> I said the closest. I didn't say it was going to be good. Oh well, that's fine. So how, how, have you, how have you been? How have you been, man? Been good. I've been super busy trying to um, get the the first the, the Kickstarter up and going for Blue Planet, and then um, in the aftermath of that, getting freelancers and artists on board. Uh, so we're in the midst of that, but um, it's going strong. Yeah. So last time I had you on, we briefly touched on Upwind, but obviously the obviously the focus was going to be on Blue Planet at the time, since that was going through the um, going through the hype train so right. obviously I don't have to go through the humble beginnings we did that last time so what I want to focus on for this is um, how the idea of upwind really came about it was described on the Kickstarter page as Studio Ghibli meets Ralph Bakshi's Wizards but I'd like you to go into a bit more detail oh and a lot of treasure planet mixed in uh, yeah I, f I forgot about that part yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, it, it kind of happened. I uh, was part of a group of friends mm -hmm. that once a year would rent a house out in the woods and spend four days um, running role-playing games for each other. And it had become a long-standing tradition and we had started having themes like this would be like a post-apocalyptic weekend. And this next year would be, you know, uh, high fantasy. And the weekend after that would all be spy thrillers or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then we also started like other things like let's do uh, original settings or let's do hacks of, of existing games or whatever. And when it was the original setting theme, um, that's where I came up with the original impetus for the blue, for the, upwind idea um and uh used actually um a game called big eyes small mouths uh, an I, old I am very generic familiar, anime i am very familiar with 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 besom i've had i've had i've had mckinnon on like three times <laughs> yeah we we uh, ran it originally in that mm -hmm. uh, but the idea for the actual setting came i used to live on an island um and one day i was hiking up on this big hill behind where i lived and got to the top and the sky was this strange sort of gray mm -hmm. uh, and it was reflecting off the ocean so you couldn't tell where the ocean ended and the sky began and uh it looked like it was just the island floating in the air floating in the clouds mm -hmm. and it was a really strong sort of optical illusion and i thought whoa wouldn't that be cool if the you know, the whole game, a whole game setting was set in just a world of floating islands. and You had to sail in cool ships from island to island to have your adventures. And and that's where that uh, the impetus of the idea came from. And then um, I, I wrote it up for this for this weekend gaming weekend event I mentioned. And, and sort of the, the rest was history. It, it uh, sort of evolved from there. I, oddly, it didn't have um, a proprietary mechanic system for quite a bit of time after that probably many years um and it wasn't until uh i'd been working on a different different game system that i thought the two might meet meet up and be a, a good match yeah now one of the one of the big one of the big things that um that was initially sold to me when one, when one of my um students um first brought upwind to my attention Miraculously enough, this was one of the cases where I didn't dig it. I didn't dig it. Up, dig it up by myself. Someone else pointed me into the direction. Um, <laughs> was the airships? Because he's 
because this particular student is really big on airships and Max, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, when it came when it came to when it came to that was the was um the was the airship the big where the biggest part of the treasure planet um influence came in uh part of it i'm i'm a um a sailor at heart uh, in fact i'm i'm sitting in the back of a boat right now that's why it was such a hard deal trying to connect with you this evening um because I, I i barely have a phone signal um but uh, i just like ships and boats and particularly the, the golden age of sail mm -hmm. and and you know, given this idea of islands in the sky, it seemed to make sense that you know, join another one of my my loves with it, um, and have the idea of big sailing vessels going from from island to island, um, and then of course you know the ethos of Treasure Planet, the, the sort of the way it looks and that kind of um, old timey yet far future tech mm -hmm. felt like a, a good match. Um, and and so really the the visuals are um, kind of what I imagine when I think of of Treasure Planet. Yeah, um, I'm guessing now. I'm guessing the I'm guessing the Ghibli influence most mostly comes from um, work mostly comes from works like Nausicaa and um, La and Laputa. Would I be correct yeah, on that? For sure, absolutely. In fact, we reference those in the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. um, those those sort of the uh, the idea of fantastical worlds that aren't quite like ours mm -hmm. now, that was one of the one of the main threads of the game i wanted it to be a a world that was different um and not at all necessarily um connected or grounded in our world mm -hmm. um and and those those ghibli films really do sort of feel that way um and i also wanted it to be sort of the young hero like the teenage kid with with too much power and responsibility mm -hmm. um and that was a a, a big sort of uh, secondary theme in the in the game mm -hmm. now since you since you mentioned being a sailor at heart i i i would be remiss if i didn't ask this dumb question have you ever sung a shanty uh <laughs> jeff doesn't sing <laughs> I, I sing them in my I, I sing them in my heart, but I have a profoundly terrible singing voice. I listen to them. Uh, Spotify uh, sends me recommendations all the time because I listen to enough of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't sing them myself. I no. wouldn't be surprised if you have a playlist dedicated to the Dread Crew of Oddwood. That makes sense. <laughs> uh well, that that's that's more or less that's more or less what they do what they do. Um, now, when it now um, obviously, within within this within this kind of within this kind of um setup, you have a you have, I think it would be fair of me to say that you have a, um, built in I won't say built in but rather a gentleman's agreement kind of kind of setup when it comes to the default player character background that they are a that they are a member of the Explorer Knights. Yeah, that's it's articulated in the in the game. I mean, it, it you don't certainly have to play that way, um, but we recommend it in the in the campaign setup. That's the default expectation because that's sort of what the game is built around. We do provide some guidance if you choose to play characters from some other origin, but there's so much of the content of the books that's dedicated to the Explorer Knights and the Explorer Knights Academy, and there's some mechanics that are actually specific to Explorer Knights. Mm -hmm. um so so yeah it, it's I don't, I don't i'd go farther than the gentleman's agreement it's just sort of the default campaign like many many games have a, this idea that you like if you're playing eclipse phase you're playing firewall and if you're playing call of cthulhu you're playing investigators and if you're playing yeah so it's similar yeah i would i'd bring up that if you're that if some if someone was playing um legend of the five rings they'd likely be playing samurai although there are Ex obviously with every rule there are exceptions um and as they say in my sure, day sure. job there are more exceptions than rules um but when it but for that I'd, li I'd like to focus a bit more on the on the explore on the explorer knights um especially especially since the, especially since those two words alone have con have connotations with a lot of people that um 
for that for most would seem co not contradictory but certainly in conflict so i'd like you to i'd like you to go over what it, what the t what the tip if somebody was doing a party of explorer nights what a what the quote unquote typical campaign would be and what some of the um some of the tr some of the media some uh, media that you could that you could use as a analog for new GMs. It's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I can really only speak to the games that I've run. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you know a, a typical campaign would look like. I just know what a typical campaign. Like. Um, generally, it's just missions or jobs by their superiors in the guild to carry out um, some objective or some or a search and rescue mission, um, a combination of sort of meets um, the, the sort of like high tech salvage experts, mm -hmm. well, like Treasure Planet, where they find this crazy machine inside the Treasure Planet that you know shows in the universe. Um, it's that same sort of ethos, mm -hmm. um, but really anything that um, you would imagine adventurers seeking lost resources, lost knowledge. Um, they're they're big into uh, as you described that the knights one of the first words the last word in their description is warriors and one of the first words in their description is scholars mm -hmm. and they are uh warrior scholars and they they spend a lot of their time studying the past and excavating the lost technology and culture and trying to understand what came before at least that's what the knights in general do. I mean, when you're actually playing a game, there's a lot of I've done a lot of exploration with my parties. They don't do a lot of you know in any in any game where there's studying going on, it's usually a die roll, right? There's not a lot of time spent doing it, mm -hmm. um, at least at table time. Um, though there may be a lot of uh, in-game time, things that my typical parties have done. Mm -hmm. Now, that br that brings me to. Um... That brings me to the the concept of elemental magic. Now we'll get we'll get into the crunchy crunchy aspect of it through through things like potentials and the like. But what I'd ma what I mainly like to go go into is the general idea and what on what you were trying to go with when it came to when it came to your approach to magic within the setting and how and how that relates to player characters being able to utilize. Um, magic through potentials right right um well i i wanted a, um something that felt uh really dynamic mm -hmm. and and allowed the players to do what they wanted and i didn't want a long list of spells that had specific effects mm -hmm. i liked nature of of Demist and Avatar, right? If you could imagine doing it with those forces of nature, then you should then you should be able to do it. Um, and that's sort of the the impetus behind the freeform nature of of using supernatural powers in in Upwind. We don't really refer to it as magic. It's just a supernatural force. I mean, it's obviously magic, right? Hmm. But I mean, they, they don't think of it that way. They think of it as manipulating a, a force like um, like the wind, like the like fire, right? Those are ex forces that exist, but if you can control them, they're they're a different kind of force than than you might think of as 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 magic. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so that was part of it, trying to make it feel like there were these um, base materials that everyone knew about, 
in mundane life that could be used supernaturally. Uh, and then mechanically using the cards like we do, uh, it allows players to do whatever they feel like within sort of the thematic scope of their particular chosen element. Yeah. Now, as as I as I understand it, the four el- the four elements that you have are wind, or rain, and arc. Um, would those be- would I was I was going to rem- I was going to remark about about the about um the analogousness to to the Hellenistic elements, but uh, obviously something like arc doesn't qualify because typically electricity is u- whenever it's used in that setup. Like how it was in Avatar, it's usually a subtype of an element. Whereas yeah, never... it's it's really just maps over the four elements that we're most familiar with in in modern culture, like you know, wind, water, uh, fire, and earth. Um, it's just I wanted to give them a, a little bit of flavor that was unique to the setting, and since it was sort of a, a Tesla punk setting um, where electricity was. was it, sort of the the um, de facto power source. Uh, I just mapped electricity over fire in that case, mm-hmm. and really the effects end up being the same in terms of play. All right. Now, now that that since you've um, since you hinted at the card system, um, let's di- let's dive headfirst into that, or sure. if, or if you prefer, do a cannonball off the high dive. Right. Don't do a cannonball off the high dive, everybody. Um, unless you wanted unless you wind up with a broken tailbone. <laughs> um but now early early on you mentioned that the that the initial draft of this was an extensive hack of Besom. I'm guessing that was Besom 3rd edition cuz based on based on my assumptions with the timeline I don't think 4th edition would have been out yet unless you were using 2nd. Uh yeah, no, this was this was yeah, 15 years ago at least. So So the, it might even been 1st edition. I have no idea. I d- I I have my doubts about whether it w- whether it was first edition because that was a vi- that was that had a very limited um, spread compared to like when it, whenever I talk to old school Besom fans, most of them will bring up second edition as their as their break in. Um, it might have been I I don't know it's it's the only time I've ever actually played it and and it was a long time ago. Yeah, that's but go but um going from going from a fairly a fairly light um on cr- on crunch kind ca- crunch kind of setup fair i'm really stretching the word fairly by the way <laughs> to uh, to a car- to a card based highly narrativistic system um i'd like you to go i'd like you to walk me through the transition between the two and what made you decide to go with this car- to go with this card based approach that you do well, it kind of started out as a joke, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, not like a sarcastic joke where I was just trying to be funny and then move on. But um, I, I am notorious amongst my friends for my dice luck being terrible. Um, I, I'm a, a scientist by training, and so I don't, you know, I believe strongly in statistics. But boy, oh boy, does my dice luck make me want to believe in black magic, <laughs> or at least, cur- at least curses, um, um, because it seems pretty atrocious. So I was trying to come up with a game system that didn't use dice and that didn't really use uh, a direct... So what I had started with was an idea that like, you had a certain... Achieve the, the end that you wanted. And that it, you were budgeting out these, and then lo and behold, you know, Gumshoe came. And at some point, I realized, well, you know, you could have. Problem was, the problem was this: if you had a finite number of points, at some point you would run out of them, and the moderator, the game master, would only would have a hard time sort of bringing a game to conclusion to time it right with everyone running out of points. Mm-hmm. And how do you balance? I mean, there's ways to do it, but it's complicated to try and balance between the game masters. E- equivalent points and your equivalent points and have the story not unbalance itself along the way. Mm-hmm. But then I realized that cards are a way of generating points in lots of games. I mean, they're shoot centuries and centuries of card games. They generate points and there's a balance between, you know, the players in or the dealer and the players 
that um, is maintained by new hands of cards. So I thought, well, let's let's sort of use cards as the basis for these points. Mm -hmm. And then step by step over the course of several years, I would have an idea about how the system might work and I'd jot it down and then I'd think about it and I'd have an idea and jot it down. In fact, the first time I ever play tested the system was actually on Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. um, not for Blue Planet, but I was with a friend on a trip and we played a little solo game and I wanted to test out these mechanics. And I thought, well, I'll just use the Blue Planet setting to test out these mechanics. I know the setting and I can just improv a game real quick. And um, we both really liked the mechanics as the at least in that early form. And so I got more and more enthusiastic about it. And, and um, at some point, as I was working simultaneously on the upwind setting and the, this card-based role-play mechanic, I realized that the four cardinal elements of the upwind setting could map directly over the four suits of cards. And then the rest was history. I'm like, oh, well, shoot. Why don't I just put these two games, this game and this setting together and as soon as I did that, I just started seeing um, way after way that the cards could be connected to the somatic elements of upwind. Um, and, and then it just seemed like, you know, if you look at them now, it looks like they clearly evolved together. And they did to a point, but only after, you know, each had evolved on its own separately for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now... Before before we get before we get into the nitty gritty of things, I would like to I would like to set the sta set the stage a bit since there's there has been plenty of ca of card based approaches that have co that have come around he that have come and gone here here in the monastery, whether whether it be so whether it be saga machine or um par or parcel or parcelings or even the old even the old saga system from TSR in the nineties, um and all of them obviously used a suit use this a suit based card deck um saga system kind of cheated a little but that's a that i'm getting ahead of myself so i'd like to go go over the skinny with with how it works before i before i really delve into the um the query cuz for a lot of people listening to this this is going to be their first introduction to the system uh... Well, a narrative system, mm -hmm. and the cards are used as a way to generate points that you can use to bid on the outcomes you want. Importantly, it's a it's a, a stakes-based bidding system. Mm -hmm. So um, when you have an encounter, just like any other game, right, you've come over the hill and you see the pirate uh, ship landing in the village, and you charge in to challenge the pirate crew to, to defend the townspeople. Um, and then instead of rolling initiative and rolling a sword attack and rolling a pistol attack and rolling a dodge attack and rolling another pistol attack um, over and over again, like a traditional incremental system, in, in Upwind, you will define the circumstances and um, you will determine what you want to, what stakes you want for your outcome. So the moderator will say, well, if you if you win, what do you want? And the players will say, well, we want to drive off the pirates and we want to save the townspeople. And oh, by the way, we want the townspeople to be so happy that we saw us. And then the moderator says, okay. Then you all wake up in the brig of the pirate ship and you've been, you know, you're being whisked off to, to their secret base on a, on a distant island. Um, and then the part players are like, oh, that's kind of, it's kind of heavy. Okay, that's a big consequence. So let's add... Um, the townspeople are so excited that they give us um, directions to the the treasure we're seeking. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And you go to get back and forth till you're both confident and, and happy with what you might get. And then you um, decide how many cards you want to bid on that outcome. And the moderator will tell, all the moderator has to do is decide, is it a... Um, a one card, two card, or three card play, meaning is it easy, difficult, or very, very challenging? Mm -hmm. And um, that's the number of cards they get to play out of their hand. And the players get to play a certain number of cards out of their hand based on the level of the attribute that they're using. So the attributes are also narrative. Let's say that the character wants to challenge the captain to a the pirate captain to a duel, so they're using their um, 
greatest swords person in the guild's attribute. And these attributes, the players have, have written up for their characters in any way that they want to describe them. And they've signed a number, one, two, or three. And that's the number of cards they get to play. They also have to have assigned a suit. So maybe that's one, two, or three of hearts. So if they have three hearts in their hand, they can play three hearts if they've assigned it a three. Or if they have only two hearts in their hand, they can play two. Or maybe it's a skill that they've only given two hearts. Mm -hmm. So the moderator will just tell them, okay, it's a two-card play because he's a pirate captain, but he's not the greatest swordsman. So it's a two-card play. And then the players will be, well, I've got uh, I've got my greatest swordsman in the guild, and I've given that a three, so I'm going to play three cards. Oh, and I've also got these bonus cards, and there's there's lots of rules on how you can generate bonus cards. We don't mm -hmm. need to go into those here, but but maybe they'll play a bonus card. Um, maybe there's a way that one of their party members can help them, so they get to add um, some helping cards, and then they play their cards, and the moderator can also generate some bonus cards for the for the moderator's NPCs, and then real dramatically, everyone lays their cards out, and there's a total number, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's a maybe there's a total of ten on one side and twelve on the other side. Whoever mm -hmm. wins wins the stakes and that's the way the story goes kind of in a in a uh, schrodinger's cat sort of way right like mm -hmm. we've decided these stakes we don't know which one it's going to be oh the moderator won now you're all in the break or oh no the players won and now the town's people are cheering, carrying them around their shoulders and throwing them a big party mm -hmm. Um, and then the, start, the story jumps forward from there, uh, following the new the outcome. It it makes for a very fast an hour to an hour of you know sort of the, with the play of the cards, mm -hmm. and very descriptively and very narratively, so the players know exactly how they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish, um, and what the outcomes are. Yeah. Um, and because so that's of, it. That's in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. And now the now the the whole the whole bit the whole bidding and blu and bluffing setup since um. Obviously, nobody can nobody can see nobody can see either side's cards until until the time comes. Right. Um, I'm cu I'm curious I'm curious um, how um, what prom what prompted that particular approach as well as as well as the focus more on scenes rather than rather, rather than indiv rather than individual events. Well, the scenes were a narrative thing, and I was getting in the narrative games when I was working on this, and it also seemed to fit. Uh, hands of playing cards i mean it would be really it's time consuming to structure the bidding mm -hmm. right it's much slower than if you just roll a die to resolve it so if you're using the bidding structure to resolve single actions like drawing a sword or, or attacking with a sword or shooting a pistol then it's it's going to be incredibly slow mm -hmm. um and so it just lent itself to this idea of resolving bigger actions you can do it more incrementally you can make them smaller bit stakes you could say well you just drive off the the you force the captain's crew, the pirate captain and his crew, to flee the village. And now you got to chase after him. You want to do anything more, right? You can do a, a sort of smaller stakes, or you can make really big stakes. Maybe there's a whole pirate fleet, and you're going to action. Um, it really is just up to how you want it. It was scene based. Doing the bidding is slow, slower than rolling dice. But if you do it for a whole scene, then it's actually quite a bit quicker. Mm -hmm. The game runs much faster than many traditional games. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, um, obviously, obviously, that co the other the other question that I'd have I'd have given this particular um, given this particular setup is when. When it comes when it comes to when it comes to drawing cards in in the whole um, in the whole pirate situation that you offered, is it a case where one where one person would would set up a potential hand, or is it a case where everybody could set up a, a potential hand and you use the highest result? It just depends on how you want to play. Um, you can play it where every where one person is what's called the primary, and mm -hmm. they're the sort of the main action. They're the they're the it's a big action scene, but they're the ones the camera would follow. Spotlight. The resolution. Right. Um, or you can do individually where each of you is doing it an, a, a different action. And um, whoever gets the highest score, well, you know, it, it still comes down to who beats the moderator's hand. If you beat the moderator's hand, you were successful. So they're in the, the main hero of the moment. It's their, it's their action that ultimately 
um, decided the the engagement. Yeah, and one um, one of the things that I one of the things that I noticed going through. Going but through, you oh. can also set it up so that people help. You mm-hmm. can assist. Also assist. So one person can be the focus, but other players can describe how they would help. And there are certain cards that are helping cards mm-hmm. that you can play to uh, if you have them in your hand to to generate that assistance. Yeah. So it's sorry. actually really a, it's a really good way to to build up a high score for an individual. Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry about the timing. Sorry about the timing. But um, now one of the th- one of the things that I had noticed is that you ha- is that you have se- you have separate hands and decks for play and potential. Um, and what I'm what I'm curious ab- what I'm curious about is was. Was that some was that something that you always um, shot for, or was the idea of separating them into into separate decks something that emerged during early playtesting? Emerged during playtesting because I wanted a way for the like manages your basically your speedy on potential hand sort of resources in terms of your supernatural ability mm-hmm. and i wanted that to be exhaustible i wanted it to be a resource that you had to manage and so the the um play hand your skills and things when you play those cards you redraw from from the draw deck to replenish your hand immediately. Mm-hmm. The potential hand, you don't do that. You replenish it over game time or a magical power, or in this case. But... Hello. I'm still. I'm still here. Oh yeah, so yeah. At that point, when you it, it, it happened in the play testing, it was just about the differential between um, cards that you that I wanted to replenish immediately and, and uh, an in-game effect of replenishing over time. Mm-hmm. Now, with a lot of ga- with a lot of games, and I I'd say this is a I'd say this is a core thing with RPG design as a whole. You have a you have a you have a setup where all where all roads lead to the your Rome in that case. And a lot of a lot of means to bend or even or even break that setup. Um, so that brings me to the primary kind of monkey wrenches that can be that can be thro- that can be thrown in, that can be thrown in. Um, specifically, uh, specifically, um, I what I want to f- what I want to focus on is th- is things like um, caches and how and how that system particularly came about. Um, I liked the idea of players being able to affect their odds. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the whole bidding system is about players getting to choose their odds rather than relying on dice. Remember, this was this was my attempt to avoid having to depend on randomizers, right? Or at least fully on randomizers. And you could control your own odds. You could really invest in the things you wanted to make sure you succeeded in um, and hedge your bets. Mm-hmm. And caches were a way to do that but it was a way to do it narratively so that you know your caches were just groups of cards that you earned through different events either as outcomes in your stakes or that you got from circumstances narrative circumstances and you could use them to just bump your scores yeah now you could invest them play mm-hmm. those extra cards now is would it be would it be a case of, of some of these be of a cash representing a a card that's stowed away that they that they can swap uh, they don't swap; they just add it in. It depends on the circumstances. Mm-hmm. You know, caches. Some of the your characters come with a couple of caches built in. Mm-hmm. They get a cache for being a knight um, that they can use in any circumstance. It's a one card per session um, card that they can use any time during the session for for any reason. It's just because of their qualifications as a knight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they also get a culture cache. They get an ancestry cache. And they get a uh, like a personality cache, like a, a particular personality trait. Mm-hmm. And then, and if the narrative circumstances fit, they can just add those cards to the particular play. But the narrative circumstances have to fit, and you have to kind of justify its use. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it add, it just adds on top of the score. Yep. You can also earn caches as part of play. So you could say, we want the village to be so excited for the fact that we saved them 
that they will help us out next time we're in town if we need supplies or whatever. And so the moderator goes, okay, you'll get a cash from the village that you can use anytime the people from that village will be involved mm -hmm. um, because they would give you aid or advice or information. Yeah. Um, and um, so, so that's another way that caches can appear. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you said that one of the reasons that you ended up go ended up going with the setup that you did is just you didn't want a exhaustive spell list for say potentials. But was one of the other goals that you had to make sure that um and that any sort of any sort of conflict system was unified, i.e., you don't have you don't have to deal with a set a set of combat rules for on the ground or um ship or ship to ship. It's all in it's all in one um package. Well. I don't know how intentional that was, but, uh, you know, emergent in terms of uh, emergent effects, uh, it's a great, my favorite thing about upwind as a game master is it's super easy to run because mm -hmm. everything works the same way. You don't have to even generate NPCs. You just have to the only thing you have to decide is how to, and uh, you use, you know, you know, cannons versus swords versus men versus uh, scientific investigation versus criminal investigation. It's all the same mechanic. So there's, it is, once you've got the core mechanic down and understand the bidding and the caches, um, then it, it, everything runs all right. super smooth and super fast without um, any kind of variation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually turned out, it, 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 you can think of Upwind as kind of like, uh, the characters in Upwind are kind of like superheroes in their own setting. Mm hmm um and i've actually used this system um because the mechanics balance out super invulnerable at three at card three um and someone else can say you know um i'm i'm a tough little dude at three and even though they sound very different and have much sort of grander aspirations mechanically it's perfectly balanced they're both they're both um uh, at three they're both that power level and and you really don't have to worry about imbalancing the system because you, you can't now with that with that and with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind um obvious obviously that obviously this kind of this kind of setup um has it has its so uh, could, it couldn't you you couldn't use the t the typical method of adva method of advancement that's that's often seen in in RPGs um, of of some sort of experience whether it's experience thresholds or experience as currency and instead if I'm not mistaken you ended up using um, blazes um, how did that concept come about and what what was the aim of um, a system like blazes so blazes is 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 not exactly um... The, uh, the advanced mechanic um it's the narrative part perhaps of of advancement mm -hmm. really it's that was meant to tie the blazes scale was meant to tie the characters to the guild in that as they um, have adventures they they earn blazes of rank for doing cool things for the guild mm -hmm. and um over time it kind of creates a narrative record of of their adventures um, it doesn't really provide them with uh, any kind of mechanical benefit. Mm -hmm. The way the actual character advancement works is that as you use your attributes, every time you attempt something, whether you are successful or not, you put a little hash mark um, the character as little around around a little ring of dots around the um, um, increments of three. Mm -hmm. Let's say um, when you've used it three times, then you can raise it to a two, and then raise it to a, 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 a three um, a, as you advance, or you can add a new attribute into the system. Mm -hmm. But you just have to have used it a certain amount of times. Um, so when you when you've done it three three times, you go up one. When you've done it six times, you go up. Six more times you put it go up two, and you know nine more times, it goes up to three. Mm -hmm. um, it may not seem like it takes very long to get there, and in a way, it's not because it's meant to be you know a Studio Ghibli style narrative story. But the way the game actually works out in play, 
you don't use the same attributes uh, quite as frequently as you might um, a particular skill in a more traditional game. Especially, so it does take a little more time. Um, I'd, I'd say that's especially the case since if I'm unless I'm misreading it, um, when you when you're when you're setting up the cards for a play, they have to be of a, they have to be of a matching suit to which to whichever skill is, is being used. Um, so because because of Correct. that, there's going to be a degree of um, focus in terms of what you're what you're actually using. You can't du you can't double or triple dip into things. Right. right. Oh. And that's correct. That now, um, when it com when it comes to the when it comes to that particular setup, and I know I I know I end up saying that a lot. It's a bad habit of mine. Um, there's the whole th one question I had was on the threshold between abilities and skills, since. This is a very narrative game, so I think I think um, determining what would what would lean towards more of an ability and what would lean towards more of a skills is a um, discussion worth having. Yeah, I, I that's a question that people frequently have. Um, I wish that I had. It's just a narrative descriptor more made a mechanical difference mm -hmm. but um narratively attributes are inherent right uh and skills are things that the characters would have had to learn or train mm -hmm. they don't they don't necessarily mean they're exclusive because there are inherent things that you can train as well um and you can train inherent characteristics and, and there are some things that people happen to be good at even if they haven't trained but that's essentially the distinction your attributes are the things that you sort of are just naturally talented in um, or things that you're capable of, like, you know, being charming or being uh, funny. Those seem to be more um, talents for a lot of people than they are actual, like, things they learn to do. Um, but, but uh, yeah, and then things like trigonometry or, or, or um, you know, biological science. Tend to be things that people people train more skill like. Mm -hmm. That's the only distinction. Um. Now, that now the other thing that I was the other thing I was curious about is. So I want to give you a heads up. I'm at ten percent. Oh, all right, all right, all right. I'll tr I'll um. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try not to extend it too extend it too much. But now, I know. I just I, want to give you a warning in case I just cut out at some point. All right. All right. Um. Now, as I, now as now, I know that I know that um. Current currently, there's the currently the focus is on um is on blue is on blue planet, but in the in the in the time in the time since it's launched, you've obviously put out the core book. Along with the um, along with the campaign sor campaign um, source book, um, the Prophecy of the Grand Amplifier, um, as well as as well as a fo a follow up, I believe, which was the Kingdoms in the Light. Um, rather, uh, rather the three, be was... three beasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what what are your what are some of your future plans when it comes to Upwind? I know I know that Blue Planet is cur is currently the focus. Yeah, I'll be honest. There, there aren't any plans at the moment. Um, the I don't know how much you know sort of the, the backstory of the, the the Kickstarter for Upwind and, and how that whole thing played out. But the the project was actually going to be done in conjunction and cooperation with Nocturnal Media, which um, is uh, Stuart Wick's. Uh, Company Stuart Wick from um, White Wolf fame, um, vampire and mage and werewolf, um, and in the middle of the project, he um, unexpectedly uh, passed away, mm -hmm. and uh, his company folded with him. Like you know, they they, they folded up the company, um, and and so the the plans to kind of make it a, an ongoing line kind of folded up with it, um, and so. 
we have, you know, we own it and have all the rights to it and, and what have you. But uh, as far as new products, I, I can't say that there are plans for those. Um, there is an OGL and I know that various people are doing different um, uh, hacks of the system for use in other games. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so that might be sort of where it has continued life. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I couldn't even hazard the guess as to whether I'll, I'll be involved in one. All right. All right. And I'll, um, I may end up doing a deep dive onto, onto some of those OGL projects because I'm always curious how how somebody takes a idea, a idea and just runs with it in their own way. But Yeah, it definitely mm-hmm. provides insight to the, to the mechanics. You look mm-hmm. back and say, oh, you know what? They had a much cooler idea of how to use that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with all that said, I, I, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and, de- and um, dealing with the pain of technology to come back up to the temple. Oh, no worries. It's always a blast. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here... That's drink- very kind of you. Yep. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I have my beer right here handy, so... Good. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!